Hello. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. So thank you everyone for being here with us this afternoon. And uh, today we will start our regular meeting on October 11, which happens to be a ladies day as well. So today I would like to call to order and uh, call on our VP Director, Mr. Howie Kalieha, as our acting president. Howie. Okay, fellow Rotarians, the power vested in me and uh, by, um, in lieu of uh, our president, Mike Escaler, I call this meeting to order. So moving forward, I would like to call on our invocator, Mr. Harley Liano. Okay, uh, gentlemen, good morning, everybody, and ladies, uh, let's pray. We come before you, Lord our God, in awe of your power and might, heaven and earth are surely full of your glory. We come in celebration of the truth that you, the God of the whole universe, chose us to reveal yourself. To us in Jesus Christ, such a gracious act, true, overwhelming, and we rejoice that the world and our lives have been transformed. In Jesus, we see life totally shaped by your justice, mercy, and righteousness. And through his sacrificial love, our lives have been empowered and reshaped by this same kingdom values. May we find not only the answer to our questions, and prayers, but may we find, O oh Lord, and your most precious will. We ask to grant us our hearts that are gentle, kind, and loving. May this event be a genuine expression of our thanksgiving and praise for all your gracious gifts, O oh God. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And now we'd like to move on to our national anthem. Let us all sing together our national anthem. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful 
national anthem singing. And now we'd like to move forward with our R.C. Makati hymn. That was wonderful, everybody. And uh, we'd like to move forward now with our four-way test. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. And that is our four-way test. Now, for today, we would like to move on with Greetings to our birthday celebrants and uh, wedding anniversary celebrants. We would like to recognize the birthdays of fellow Rotarians, P.P. Eddie Yap, on October 13. P.P. Roger Davis on October 17. Roger Coliantes, October 19. Roger Sarmiento. October 21, and Carlo Ibanez on October 21 as well. For our Rotary Ants, we have Celebrants Army Jimenez on October 18, Teo Di Buenaflor on October 23. For our wonderful wedding anniversaries, we have Couples celebrating, such as P.P. Joe and Mary Lou Alejandro on October 20. Tetu and Marisa Garcia, October 20 as well. Freddie and Ali Placino on October 22. Let's give a round of applause to our birthday celebrants and wedding anniversaries. Now, moving on, we would like to do a presentation of our inductee. Okay, so before that, we'll do the uh, Paul Harris recognition first. 
headed by PDG Tony Kila. Thank you, Brian. Unfortunately, uh, Quas Lu was yes. supposed to receive his well, Harris Pin is not here yet. So let me just call on uh, on Neil Makashar to get his certificate of Paul Harris from the district. Now to introduce our incoming member to be inducted today, may I call on Vit Vittorio B. Lim. Here, to classification wealth securities and uh, sponsored by past president Tito Panlilio. May I ask uh, Acting President uh, Philip Sullivan to induct V. Oh, no, we'll have charge him first. <laughs> uh, Past President Jun Jun, direct to do the charging. Uh. Uh, good afternoon, V. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Makati. You know, you are joining a very prestigious club. It's the <clears throat> biggest club here in District 3830 and uh, probably the most prestigious club in the Philippines. <laughs> Why did you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, Vic, I will ask you, uh, uh, V. I will ask you the following questions and uh, answer in the affirmative, okay? Are you ready to be a leader with integrity? Yes. Are you ready to serve humanity? Yes. Are you ready to live by the four-way test? Do you know the four-way test? A little. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it the... Is it fair? Will it build. build goodwill and better friendships? And is it beneficial to all concerned? So you're ready to live by the, those four. Okay. Are you ready to bring goodwill and peace along the way? Are you ready to give hope to the world? All right. Are you ready to pay your dues completely and on time? <laughs> Are you ready to attend the regular meetings of the club? And finally, are you ready to join at least one committee to mm. join the uh, uh, projects of the club? Yes. Well, uh, Mr. President or Vice President, Acting President. Philip. Acting President. Incoming yeah. President. Oh, incoming President Philip. <laughs> Our inductee is ready to be inducted because he has answered in the affirmative to all the questions that I threw at him. Welcome, V. Uh, can you please uh, raise your right hand? Can we ask everyone to stand up, please? And then if you can... Rotarians uh, to stand up. If, if you can repeat after me. I, after being sworn in as a member of the Rotary Club of Makati, do solemnly swear that I will abide by, follow and uphold, 
all the provisions of the Constitution and bylaws of Rotary International, as well as those of my Rotary Club, and fulfill to the best of my ability all the duties and responsibilities of my membership. I pledge to advance the object of Rotary and to exemplify Rotary's maxim, service above self. I further swear to promote awareness of the theme of Rotary International in 2022-2023, imagine Rotary and the duties and responsibilities that go with it. All these I pledge freely and voluntarily without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. Can we ask Tito Panilio to put the apron? And you're invited to sign. Okay, so uh, well, that was a wonderful induction, and uh, we welcome our new member and brother V. It's great to have you here with us. 
And it's nice to see that our group is uh, ever growing and uh, always being, uh, we're including great individuals with uh, very impressive backgrounds as well. So thank you all for a wonderful induction. And moving forward, we would like to proceed with acknowledgement of some of our guests and visiting Rotarians. We would like to recognize dignitaries, PDG Tony Kila. And for the ants, we'd like to recognize Miss uh, Rachel Harrison, Nelly Bengzon, who is online, Yvonne Kwan, online together with us as well, and Menchu Pasqual, and Camille Makassiar. We also have some guests here with us today, namely Cecil Ang, guest of Rotarian V. Lim. Another guest we have here with us today, Shelo Legaspi, guest of director Sony Hambunting Jr. Okay, so next up, we would like to move forward to calling our charging officer, Jun, PP Jun Jun Dayrit. Okay, so we're done with that. We'll move forward to the president's time. Let's call on Director Philip Sullivan. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and um, gentlemen. So first of all, I I guess you're wondering what I'm doing up here, no? So I did check, and for sure, there is no such thing as a future president's training program, okay? So I'm not here for that purpose. Anyway, with that, allow me to deliver the message of President Michael Escaler. Um, welcome to our Rotary Ants. Today is, um, is uh, the Ants Day. And uh, this is the first one for the year. Uh, we will be scheduling other Rotary and days when our ants will be running the show. So to speak, right? Because today apparently that's not what's happening. Uh, and uh, But the future ants, they will be planned and organized by the ants. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Diva Gunigundo of the Central Bank, a former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, uh, and look forward to his very enlightening uh, and insightful discussion. So thank you for accepting our invitation on short notice, uh, Sir Gunigundo. Uh, next week, we will not be having a Rotary luncheon meeting as we have reserved that week for our service project activity, a time for committees to update and implement their projects. But I hope some members can find the time to participate in at least one of these activities. Um, so as for the past, um, so what we have is on Wednesday, there, uh, the 12th of October, we have a 9 a.m. Um, uh, get-together at the San Bartolome Church in Malabon for breast and cervical cancer screening projects for about 100 beneficiaries. On Thursday the 13th, 2 p.m. at the South Luzon uh, State University in Infanta, we have the turnover of our three dorm, third dorm project. The team will be staying there overnight and will be heading back to Manila um, the next day. I'm not sure if this event is still pushing through. Oh, okay. It's, it's been postponed to another day. Okay. But it's going to happen. It just won't happen um, in the next few days. So the 16th of October, we have um, at 4 p.m. at the La Pavilion in Ross Boulevard, we have the District 3830 October Fest. The club has sponsored a table for 10, 10 uh, members. So if you're interested in that, please do sign up for uh, the October Fest on the 16th of October. On the 21st of October, that's a Friday at 8.15, uh, 
the, at the Summit Point Golf Club in Lipa, Batangas, there's the first leg of the Governor's Cup uh, golf tournament. And then on Saturday, 22nd of October, 3 p.m. at the RCM Clubhouse in Guadalupe, Viejo, Makati, we've got a Halloween party uh, in partnership with our publicist production group uh, through the through the efforts of Sue and Nolito in coordination with RCC, Bukluran, and Rotary Club, Rotaract Club of Makati. So this is a Halloween party um, for the kids uh, at Guadalupe Viejo. Stuff I'd like to add, no? So I'd like to thank uh, P. N. Keith and Rachel Harrison for representing the club at the 3830 Aces and Queens charity dinner last Sunday at the Okada Manila. Thank you. And uh, th thanks also to Yvonne Kwan for inviting us to attend the fourth Dr. Robert F. Kwan Memorial Lecture on Friday, October 14th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. via Zoom. Uh, so this is to commemorate the uh, death anniversary of our uh, past district governor, uh, Robert Kwan. Last but not least, I'd like to call uh, uh, our Rotarian Gani Buenaflor uh, to receive his award as first runner-up in the district 3830. <coughs> Congratulations, Gani. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, to our today's president for that great speech. So moving ahead, we'd like to proceed with the introduction of our guest speaker to be done by PN Keith Harrison. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Our guest speaker today is an economist, a journalist, an author, a central banker, retired central banker, and a theologian. Sorry, can't pronounce it. I'd like to uh, introduce today Diwa Ginigundo. Is that how did I do? Close, close, close okay. Uh, our speaker for this afternoon. He's the senior pastor of the Fullness of Christ International Ministries. But before all of that, or rather, while during, during all of that, he, he um, was a central banker with the Banco Central de Filipinas for 41 years, retiring only in 2019. He's also a former alternate executive director at the IMF in Washington, D.C. from 2001 to 2003, and he was a research head at Chen Center Kuala Lumpur from 92 to 94. He graduated cum laude at the University of the Philippines um, of economic, in economics and completed his graduate studies at the economics, uh, in economics at the London School of Economics. There are too many economics in this sentence. He's a, as a scholar at the time of the uh, Central Bank of the Philippines. In the ministry, he holds an honorary doctor of divinity and from, from the Promised Christian University of Los Angeles in California. And he's been the senior pastor uh, since 2003 and a member of the elders of the nation uh, since 2020 and the vision keeper of Touching Heaven, Changing Earth since 2005 for the cause of nation transformation. Mr. Gunigundo 
writes weekly columns for the Manila Bulletin and Business World. He's a member of the advisory panel of Simke, Simki Boon Institute for Financial Economics from the Singapore Management University. He's an independent director of AIA, Investment Management and Trust Corporation in the Philippines, and has been since 2020. Um, he's an external advisor to Bain & Co. And then in 2021, he pu published the first of three books, Trauma and Triumph, Rising of the Ashes uh, of the ASEAN Financial Crisis, then Redefining Strategic Routes to Financial Resilience in ASEAN Plus Three, and now Beyond the Crisis, a Strategic Agenda for the Next President. Towards the end of 2022, he expects to be publishing the Economic Adjustment uh, and another one, uh, vehicle, Economic Adjustment and Growth, Theory and Practice, which he co-authors with Dr. Dilano de Villanueva and Dr. Roberto uh, Mariano. He's a fellow of the Foundation of, for Economic Freedom and a convener of One Sambayan. Please welcome today our speaker, Diwa Gunigundo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> if I were to write a paper on what is happening today in the Philippine economy, I will certainly focus on the economic consequences of rising inflation on account of, among others, the weakening of the Philippine peso. But offhand, I would like to say that assessing the recent trends of both domestic inflation and the peso dollar exchange rate would demonstrate to us one of the greatest paradoxes of our modern times. When the peso depreciates, and we are seeing that today, or weakens, if you will, this is transmitted as a pass through to inflation. In short, every time the peso depreciates, it sends forth some pressure, in economic terms, impulses to inflation. Now, since many of our food and fuel requirements are imported, and they account for a big portion of our consumer basket, every peso of depreciation causes inflation to rise. Central banks, including our very own Banco Central ng Pilipinas, or BSP, can either intervene in the foreign exchange market and use up its precious foreign exchange reserves or intervene in the money market or by jacking up interest rates and risk a possible recession. A policy dilemma in itself since we are very much a part of the global economy. And I should hazard to say we are at that point when the BSP is caught between intervening heavily in the foreign exchange market and use up its reserves and jacking up interest rates and risk a recession or a slowdown of the economy. Next chart. As Mahatma Gandhi wisely said, what you do in life will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. This afternoon, what I want to do is to explain why the BSP, as the country's monetary authorities, should do something which to many may seem unfruitful. And failing to do it could be tragic because the consumers are bound to be the losers in this game. Therefore, I have to thank the Rotary Club of Manila, 
the officers and members for inviting me to this luncheon meeting today. This gives me an opportunity. Oh, sorry, Makati. I forgot uh, what Junjun was saying, the most prestigious. <laughs> the main question we need to ask this afternoon is straightforward. Should we be concerned about the exchange rate hitting beyond 58 to a dollar a few weeks ago and 59 just yesterday? Or when Albay Congressman Joey Salceda claimed that because there seems to be no resistance against the strong U.S. dollar and there seems to be no anchor, the peso could further weaken to as low as 68 to a dollar. What economic consequences should we expect if this trend continues? Next chart. Well, if we mix our chronology to make things clearer in their proper context, almost exactly four years ago, then Budget Secretary Ben Jokno was not obviously concerned. To him, it was unlikely that the Philippine peso would sink to 58 pesos to a dollar. At the time, inflation raged at an average of 5.2% in 2018, due primarily to the unprecedented rise, not only in fuel, in fuel, but also in fuel prices, because the global markets were raging at that time. The peso weakened from 50.404 in 2017 to 52.661 in 2018. Not as weak as today, but the peso nonetheless motivated the rise in domestic inflation. Today, as finance secretary, he believed we should be indifferent with the level of the peso. That was four years later. Obviously, he was talking of external competitiveness based on the so-called REER, or real effective exchange rate of the peso. With hindsight, of course, we know that in 2018, the BSP itself showed some concern about the movement of both the peso and the domestic inflation. With the weakening of the peso, inflation nearly doubled during the year, from 2.9 to 5.2%. The facts can speak for themselves. The BSP tightened monetary policy by 175 basis points. And it also intervened in the FX market to the tune of over $2 billion. So on one hand, the BSP tightened monetary policy by 175 basis points, and at the same time, intervened heavily in the foreign exchange market, using up $2 billion of its precious reserves. The BSP, even on hindsight, was correct to me to do something about the situation then. Some people love to say we should not do anything because the problem is not the weak peso. It is the strong dollar. Two points, ladies and gentlemen. Next, next chart. First, the U.S. continues to tighten monetary policy fast and furious because of historic high inflation rate exceeding 8%. Okay? 8% is the inflation rate. In fact, it was 8.26%. Its policy rate, meaning the U.S. Fed's policy rate, is hopelessly negative because at less than 4%, that's their policy rate, versus the domestic inflation of more than 8%, it was definitely in negative territory. It is less than half of inflation. With high interest rate, foreign investments flocked back to the U.S. Those that decided to invest in emerging markets like the Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, and even in Africa, okay, they went back to the U.S., driving the U.S. dollar stronger. On this basis, it is correct to say that the dollar is strong, and that makes the peso weak. But second, and I think this is more important. The peso is also weak because of some weak economic fundamentals. In short, there are weaknesses in the domestic economy. 
if in 2018 the peso the peso also depreciated and inflation also blew up it was because our balance of payments this is the totality of everything that we earn in us dollars whether merchandise trade services capital transactions or financial transactions you sum them all okay and then you have the dollar earnings versus what we spend imports imports of services okay servicing of uh, of capital or even capital flight those are uh, potential demand or drain on uh, on the on the reserves okay at that time bop stood at nearly 2.3 billion in deficit meaning less inflow compared to outflows we were spending more than we were earning us dollars in the first 8 months of 2022 alone our bop deficit stood at 5 and a half billion compared to year ago's 253 million deficit in last years that means 2021 a surplus of 1.3 billion in short it is not correct to attribute fully the weakness of the philippine peso to a strong dollar there are economic fundamentals bad economic fundamentals that would explain the weakness of the peso our economy is also showing some weaknesses that are fueling the decline in the exchange value of the peso against the US dollar. If the BSP would not tighten monetary policy, that would actually motivate further dollar outflows, weaker peso, and higher inflation. To me, that is bad for economic growth. Next chart. And precisely a couple of weeks ago, we witnessed something very few people believed would ever happen. The peso literally plans to over 58 to a dollar, bringing the stock market with it on its way down to only 6,300. Last Friday, as I was preparing this brief presentation, I would call it brief, the peso dollar rate averaged 58.92, and the stock market further sank to 5,932. Governor Philip Vidalia got it right when he explained the right way to look at the effects of peso depreciation on domestic inflation. This was only on July 6, when the peso hit 56.06 from the end December level of 50.774. We are a lot more concerned, he says, about the inflation effects of a more depreciated peso given that we already have a very high inflation, end of quote. That's Governor Philip Vidalia of BSP. I share the view that the BSP should be seriously concerned with the weak peso because further weaknesses could add more inflationary pressure and in the process possibly disanchor inflation expectations. Let me emphasize, this must be truer today when the peso exceeded 58 to a dollar, that must have resulted in the PSEI tanking below 6,000 level. <coughs> Next chart. Now, this, is, this, this chart is simply telling us okay, the pass through from the exchange rate to inflation. And the time period, the break of the time period is 2002 when the BSP switched to inflation targeting as a framework of monetary policy. Okay? So pre-IT, meaning pre-2002, okay? IT, that means 2002 up to the end of the observation period, 2017. Let's focus on the short-run exchange rate pass-through or ERPT. Before, when one peso, when the peso depreciates by one peso, okay? you can expect to add 0.269 percentage point. Now, after 2002, we have observed that there was a decline in the past through from 0.269 to 0.042 for every peso of depreciation. It means it has gone down. Now, that implies 
we could go slow in jacking up the BSP's policy rate or stopping up its FX intervention by way of selling dollars to the foreign exchange market. Now, which brings us to the paradox of Gandhi. Yes, it may seem insignificant because the impact of the peso weakness on inflation could be minimal. But it is important that one acts fast and decisively because the BSP should continue to jack up interest rates or intervene in the foreign exchange market. Otherwise, the market might have the impression it is not concerned with such movements. In Salceda's words, no resistance and no anchor. Speculators could even be emboldened if inflation expectations are disanchored. And what is bad about a disanchored inflation expectations is that once it is disanchored, it is very difficult to bring it back. We would be seeing more persistent inflation in the process. The other reason why BSP should do something more is that the peso is depreciating big and fast. Okay? In several months, the peso depreciated by what? 50, uh, eight pesos from, from the beginning of the year to September. That's eight pesos. The market would be concerned and the pace could be sustained. So roughly, if the peso at nearly 59 yesterday to a dollar has depreciated by 8 pesos from end December 2021 level of 50.774, we should expect some 0.336 percentage point in additional inflation. So BSP has valid reason to be concerned and to act if need be. And I would believe that uh, the time is now for the BSP to act and act fast. Therein lies the paradox of Gandhi and its solution to act and to act fast. Next chart. Another way to look at this is to examine the so-called impulse response of inflation to exchange rate shocks. By breaking into sub-periods the IT years, again, 2002 up to 2022, before and after. Okay? Before 2002, that is indicated by the blue line. Okay? The impulse response of inflation to exchange rate depreciation is indicated after the uh, BSP switch to inflation targeting in, 2000 and, in 2002 is indicated by the red broken lines. The finding, the response was significantly lower after GFC or global financial crisis. That is indicated by the red broken lines. The conclusion is also the same, ladies and gentlemen. We can effectively go slow on preventing exchange rate depreciation because the impact on inflation is not that large and the potential rate risk on economic growth could not be discounted. However, when we see sharp movements within very short period and it is accumulating, the monetary authorities ought to act decisively. Market players might get a different idea that the BSP is more concerned with goals other than its own primary mandate of price stability. I heard one of the BSP governor's white scraps before that, meaning Philip Medalia, that attaining economic growth is not the primary mandate of the BSP. And one can read that in the Philippine Constitution of 1987. It is price stability. In this sense, inflation expectations might be disanchored, and I reiterate that it could entrench inflation even farther. Next chart. Well, I'm sorry for this uh, small text, but it's simply saying, in letter A, you have the nominal exchange rate of the peso. That's bilateral. Peso against the U.S. dollar from 2017 up to uh, the first nine months of the year. Okay? And then down below, letter B, that uh, gives us the so-called real effective exchange rate. It's a measure of external competitiveness. Okay? Many market commentators say that we should not be very bothered by the exchange rate level. 
it will be more useful to check the actual level of peso external competitiveness. And that is measured by letter B. That is actually a good way of assessing exchange rate movements. Nominal bilateral exchange rate simply tells us how much dollars we can buy with one single peso. Or conversely, how much pesos do we need to buy one US dollar? But in actual commercial transactions, our external competitiveness also depends on how we compare with our trading partners, meaning advanced economies and other emerging markets, which we consider to be our competitors. Putting all this together, okay, how we relate to them, how we compare to them in terms of the nominal exchange rate of the peso against the US dollar and their currencies against the US dollar and our inflation differentials, okay, how our inflation compares with our own inflation. If we put all of this together, we will produce a measure called REER. And that's indicated by letter B, real effective exchange rate. Now, what do the numbers indicate? From 2019, to last year, we have been losing external competitiveness. This year, when the peso weakened significantly, we gained some index points of external competitiveness. Okay. Now, another way of looking at it, next chart, okay, is by looking at this chart. This chart makes clearer the relative contribution of weak currency and low and stable inflation. If currency is strong, as we saw, between 2019 and 2020, and inflation was not exactly uh, low relative to those of other countries, both did conspire to weaken our external competitiveness. In 2021, to the first quarter of 2022, as the black line indicates, so the black line is goes up in the uh, first uh, quad. Uh, first uh, half of, uh, of this chart and then down, okay, we gained external competitiveness because of peso depreciation and relatively moderate inflation in 2021. So it's not just a question of nominal exchange rate uh, movements, but it's also a question of being able to keep and maintain a stable uh, price situation in the country today. Now, next chart. Now, what about, what about inflation? Okay. So I've covered the exchange rate. Now I want to cover inflation. From all angles, we should be equally concerned by actual September 2022 inflation rate of 6.9%. And the January-September 2020-2022 average inflation rate of 5.1%. They are both in excess of the inflation target of 2 to 4% for 2022 set forth by the BSP and the government. Given the new forecast of 5.6, this is the latest forecast of the BSP for the year 2022, we should be seeing further rise in domestic inflation for the last three months, October, November, and December, averaging around 7.2%. So that is what we should expect for the last uh, three quarters of the year if the 5.6% is to come to pass. Now, given that inflation has averaged 5.1% for the first six months and the expected inflation for the year is 5.6% and the policy rate is only 4.25%, still in the negative territory, we see the need for the BSP not only to continue tightening monetary policy for the end for the rest of the year and the next, but to do it more aggressively. Remember that the US Fed is very aggressive doing 75 basis points. In the past, the BSP, the, the US Fed would not move beyond 25 basis points. Okay. And sometimes there's no there's no change in monetary policy stance of the US Fed. But because domestic inflation had hit 8.26%, and they started with only 2%, okay? 2% of their policy rate. There's a long way to go before the US Fed is able to catch up with what is required 
to be able to fight inflation in the US. So there's a need for the BSP to tighten more aggressively monetary policy if we should remind ourselves works with the long and variable long. Now this chart, next chart. This chart and table clearly demonstrate the uptrend in consumer prices, okay? That, that line, uh, almost the middle of uh, the right chart, going up, okay? Without, uh, without fail. The September 2022 inflation of 6.9 is the highest since October 2018 when inflation rate also hit 6.9%. The 21 inflation rate alone at 3.9% was more than 50% higher than the 2020 inflation rate of 2.4%. In other words, the trend has been established okay, towards an increasing one for domestic inflation, not only this year, but probably spilling over to 2023. The trend and the early forecast of the BSP all conspire to tell a singular narrative. Time to tighten, and when the last two came a little late, because in May and in June, the BSP did only 25 basis points. Okay? The tightening had to be more aggressive as it has been in recent months, because there's a lot of catching up to do. 4.25, versus an expected 5.6% uh, average inflation for the, for the entire year of 2022. We are all familiar with the culprits. High food and energy prices due to one, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which resolution may not be inside now that Putin is trying to consider a nuclear solution. Uh, the unfriendly OPEC plus opportunistic oil pricing actions shortages in basic food commodities. And you know, we should be producing this in large supply. Rice, sugar, onion, garlic, and lately, even salt. Adjustments in wages and transport fares as approved by the LTFRB. And of course, the sustained weakening of the Philippine peso. Next chart. Ladies and gentlemen, as early as May of this year, the BSP has already assigned a much bigger probability of 65% that the average inflation rate for 2022 will exceed 4%. That's the upper end of the target of 2 to 4. It is quite surprising that it chose to tighten by only 25 basis points in May and still another 25 basis points in June. At that time, there was already a big number of petitions for increases in wages and transport, uh, and transport fares. In short, second round effects had emerged. Wage increases were granted in nearly all regions of the Philippines due to high inflation. Transport fare adjustments after the provisional increase of one peso in Metro Manila was granted in June. They were also given due course in subsequent months. The signs are all out there. What should the latest probabilities of hitting the target of 2 to 4% for 22, 23, and 24? Now, it's quite clear last week that the BSP is 100% certain it's giving up on the target for 2022. They're looking at 5.6 against the upper end of 4% of the target. Its forecast has in fact increased from 5.4 to 5.6. So hands down. For 2023, BSP assigned a probability of 55% that inflation would be over 4%. That's a very high probability. Its forecast was actually increased from 4 to 4.1% during the other week's meeting of the Monetary Board. For 2024, the BSP was 53% certain inflation would be between the target range of 2 to 4%, its latest forecast being 3%. Next chart. I would have wanted to discuss this, but uh, it will take me at least five minutes to do it. 
but if uh, one would be asking something about should we not uh, pursue growth, uh, this will be my answer to that potential question. Okay, so I will skip this. This is about a platter uh, Phillips carb. Okay, so let's move on. There is an additional point I wish to make. The BIS, this is the Bank for International Settlements, this year, just this year, recently observed that the broadening price pressures, as we are seeing today, may have caused households, like any one of us, and firms, companies, to move out of the zone of what they call rational inattention, within which inflation may not have much influence on their behavior to becoming more attentive to just few inflation developments. This could influence household and firm behavior substantially. Now, in the case of Filipino households, ladies and gentlemen, they were more attentive to price movements of basic commodities like food items, gasoline and fuel, utilities and alcoholic beverages. This finding is not surprising given that households tend to consume more of these basic uh, commodities relative to other goods. Now, what's the implication of that? The higher sensitivity of households and firms to a few commodities or services could motivate them, motivate them to protect themselves from higher consumer prices or profit squeezes, and in the process, contribute to higher inflation expectations. Demand for higher wages and price adjustments could therefore lead to inflation becoming more entrenched. This is the reason why quick, decisive action is critical to central banks in dealing with both a fast depreciating exchange rate and the unprecedented rise in domestic inflation. Next chart. So let me summarize what I have just discussed in the last uh, so many minutes. We are therefore seeing rapid depreciation of the peso on the left, facing the monitor. That has also motivated rapid gains in inflation as shown on the right. Quite obviously, this could suck out the steam from economic growth. If prices are so high, how many people would you expect to sustain their level of consumption? And consumption accounts for about 72% of gross domestic product. Already, various international financial institutions, for example, the IMF, have downgraded the forecast for 2022 and 2023 to less than the government's target of 6.5 to 7.5% for 2022 and 7.5 to 8.5% in 2023. Based on the various consumer and business expectation sentiment surveys, economists and forecasters, inflation expectations can be influenced by both central bank monetary action, especially if appropriate and decisive, and more recently, central bank communication. Keeping inflation expectations anchored means the public normally ignores short-term shocks, even upward blips in actual inflation, allowing the monetary authorities to respond appropriately without motivating the so-called wage price spiral. In the Philippines, we have observed that inflation expectations after 2002 have become more forward-looking rather than backward looking. In our previous research, this means the impact of previous inflation has declined relative to that of expected inflation. Forecasts and expectations have become important while central bank communications could help either anchor or disanchor inflation expectations. Based on this, the recent BSP forecast of 5.6% for 2022 and 4.1 for 2023, indicating overshooting of the inflation target could lead to a possible 
this anchoring of inflation expectations away from the target. Strong statement with strong action should be able to recast them into conditional proposition. The BSP will do what it takes to bring inflation back within target. This is crucial to ensure inflation expectations are not upset and the adverse impact of a weak peso and rapid inflation are managed and managed well. This is uh, my second to the last chart. All indications, okay. Okay. all indications point to inflation expectations having been disanchored. If you take a look at the inflation expectations of private forecasters, uh, that many broadsheets would uh, feature several days before the Philippine Statistics Authority announces the recent inflation, etc. Okay. So we see a possible disanchoring of inflation expectations. Well, this episode of rapid inflation was initially driven by supply shocks, and many people continue to believe that the BSP should not do something about it because. Inflation is something that is driven by supply shocks. Okay? It has already triggered second round effects. And those second round effects can no longer be pulled back. These are basic commodities that our ordinary households normally buy from the market. With imported food and fuel, inflation is bound to rise significantly now that the peso seems to be on a free fall. The government is also bound to lose because of its dollar requirements to service its foreign debt. And its foreign debt is now inching towards $107, $107 billion at the end of June 2022. Imports for manufacturing and other domestic uses are also bound to become more expensive. The rise in core inflation or the measure of underlying inflation also validates that inflation has become more entrenched. This inflationary spiral hits the fixed income earners among us and the poorest of the poor. Between the fourth quarter last year and the third quarter this year, the percentage of households with savings came down, which means there was a net drawdown from the household savings in the banks, and some have in fact withdrawn them all. Pending the availability of data on poverty incidents, I would hazard a guess that it has increased due to the recent rise in consumer prices and the recent report on higher unemployment in August at 5.3% and underemployment at 14.7%. When we talk about underemployment, it means that the people who are already employed are, are looking for more work or for more hours of work. It means that the quality of employment is very bad. So let me, let me conclude this uh, presentation, last chart, by saying what the author Sam Tainenhouse once said after writing tons of books nominated by, for Pulitzer Award. In literature and in life, we ultimately pursue not conclusions, but beginning. I hope after this presentation, we shall begin our journey of more understanding and more patience with the world. We cannot freeze time, but we can always begin after its learning experience. In economic management, as in business and political leadership, competence and integrity are of utmost importance, not connection. We need good governance to send that signal to the general public that beyond the peso, the exchange rate and the general economy, the government is doing something positive for the greater good. A blueprint for the future is very important. And I think the general public is looking for that now. Remember, expectations have become more forward-looking. Short of that, we might just be muddling through 
for the next six years. This should be our learning takeaway today, the beginning of more learning in the future. Thank you very much for your patience. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Diwa Ginigundo for an excellent presentation. And uh, with all the uncertainties in the world, we have better insights now after the info you've shared with us. And with that, we'd like to move forward with the Q&A. So first up, uh, Attorney Boy. Hello, hello. Buenas tardes. Tengo dos preguntar. Primero, primero. As a banker and as an economist, how do you honestly assess the way BBM addresses this problem of inflation and the weakening of the peso? Segundo, preguntar. If BBM sought for your advice, how to fight inflation against the weakening of the peso, what will you tell him? Gracias, amigo. On the first uh, question, <clears throat> I think I, uh, I, I indicated in my uh, concluding remarks that we are still waiting for the blueprint. Okay? In the first place, 31 million uh, Filipinos voted for him without the benefit of uh, a blueprint. That's one. Number two, uh, 31 million voted for him without the benefit of him participating in the debate. Okay? So it is something that we brought upon ourselves. And therefore, we need to be patient until they're able to produce a, a reasonable blueprint of what to do. What I laid out uh, earlier, ladies and gentlemen, is from the perspective of a central banker. What the central bank should do, act and act fast, okay? But inflation and the exchange rate are simple prices, market prices, okay? Inflation is simply what merchandise goods and services would cost. And if they cost higher, then you have a higher inflation. The exchange rate is also the price of foreign currency or domestic currency against your foreign currency. They simply reflect economic fundamentals. So if economic fundamentals are bad, um, then you don't expect very positive movement in both the exchange rate and the peso, which means that uh, first, agriculture will have to be given um, very, very uh, significant focus. You know, the first, uh, the first uh, problem that uh, the president brought upon himself is to assign himself to be the Secretary of Agriculture, okay? He could have assigned somebody else. There are so many technocrats and professionals who know agriculture like uh, the back of their palm, okay? Um, because it's a question of infrastructure in agriculture. It's a question of correct uh, vision about agriculture uh, we have to be the, we have to be liberal about uh, not only production but also importation look at uh, the rice tarification bill which produced to me reasonable trends in rice prices perhaps it's a question of communication but what the government is now realizing from the rice tarification bill it's between 15 to 20 billion pesos every year. And the trust of that is to funnel it back to the farmers for research and development, okay? For uh, logistics, uh, drying facilities, uh, storage facilities, uh, disease resistant and weather resistant uh, crops or varieties of rice. That should have been funneled back. But if there's no one in charge of agriculture, you know, um, it is very difficult to expect good production. Yes, it is a supply-driven problem. But if no one in government is looking after that, 
it's very difficult to expect that the supply will improve and improve fast. Industry is also very important. Infrastructure is also very important. If, if all of these things are in the proper place, I'm sure we, we should be able to at least moderate, portion the impact of uh, what we are experiencing today. Many would argue, many would argue that the global, that the problem is global. No problem. But look at Vietnam. Okay? Look at Vietnam. Um, Vietnam was able to sustain, first, the flow of foreign investments, both uh, direct investments and uh, portfolio investment. Despite all of these speculations, all of the uncertainties and volatilities in the global financial markets, Vietnam was able to sustain the flow of foreign capital. The second, the Vietnam was also able to moderate uh, the movement in consumer prices. Okay? Yes, uh, there was some nominal weakening of uh, the Vietnam dong, but not to the extent like what we're experiencing today of uh, eight pesos within the space of what, nine months. Uh, that's, that's fast and furious as I would, as I would describe it. Okay? So that's, that's how I'm going to uh, respond to your first question. Now, my second question is, I don't think he will seek my advice. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, you know, there are, there are political lines already, you know. Uh, I, I said, in, I, and I think uh, uh, Kit, Kit explained that uh, I'm a member of the Isambayan. <laughs> no? uh, so, yeah, so my point is this. I think he has good technocrats, okay? He has good technocrats. Um, they are our colleagues in government at the time that uh, we were still in government. And I think they can do well. But the problem is this. It's the political leadership that makes the call, not the technocrats, okay? Not the technocrats. Remember during the time of, uh, of President Estrada, he had a separate cabinet, the midnight cabinet. You know, so it could over it could always be uh, overridden by some political um, considerations. You know? But I think Neda has produced the so-called Ambition 2040. Ambition 2040 is a long-term uh, economic plan put together by the National Economic and Development Authority, and all of us, uh, those from BSP, DTI. Um, Department of Finance, we all participated in formulating that uh, long-term economic plan. I think all that they need to do is to look at that uh, blueprint, uh, break it down into more specific and more uh, actionable propositions. And I, I, I don't think they will, they will fail. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that question. So uh, we'll move on to PDG Tony. Yeah, actually, let's allow, uh, because uh, our retirement was with BPM in Indonesia. He'll talk about uh... what uh, Actually, I'm Harley. I was a witness on the uh, BBM uh, economic mission in Indonesia. I was there. I was one of the Philippine representative and delegate to that economic mission. Now, I just tell you like this. Uh, during the roundtable uh, conference, that was uh, the uh, members of the uh, um, what's this? The uh, the Cadin, Cadin, which is in 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 Philippines. That is the uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and some businessmen in Indonesia. And uh, the uh, the meeting there was very fruitful, precisely. Uh, I have also something to, 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 to work with the BBM group. Uh, I was in charge of the uh, coal supply to the Philippines to reduce the energy cost by almost 40%. I, I am the one who is uh, working on that. Second is in terms of the agriculture, I'm also working for the urea fertilizer because right now the urea fertilizer is really almost double, triple already the price. But you see, China uh, got, uh, no, no, not China, but Korea. 
Korea got 200,000 metric tons of urea from Indonesia on a yearly basis. And uh, of course, Philippines should have also. That's why we are working on that. We are working on that. Another one is um, for the coal. Uh, yeah, we are working on a uh, three three phases of. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator. Is he addressing the question of Attorney Boy or Deche? Yeah. Are, because are you addressing it, yeah, that question? Yeah. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Because that is also in relation to uh, the BBM approaches on how to uh, settle this inflationary uh, action. In other words, uh, if we do the government to government, because the, the only government that we can rely on is Indonesia, actually. Because Indonesia, they can supply us rice, they can supply us cement, they can supply us steel, they can supply us coal. That would help our actually economy. And that's the, the first, I think that, that would be the first approach of the BBM government to work on that barter trade. Actually, we are also working on the barter trade. You know what happened in Russia? Actually, Russia come up with the barter trade with Sukhoi jet planes, fighter planes, and palm oil. In the same way that we will do also with our tobacco and abaca fibers, we can export that to Indonesia and then barter that with coal or urea or sugar. Okay, that, that's the only thing. Thank you. All right, back to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Diwa, if BSP intervenes in the exchange market, to what extent? And uh, because if it intervenes and the peso continues to depreciate, paano yung ano, mag-uubos ang reserve ng BSP? I agree. No? I agree. That's why I said there is a policy paradox here or a policy dilemma. Uh, in the, um, at that point, when the central bank wishes to address a virtually pre-fall of the peso, they have two options. The first option is to continue increasing policy rate. Right now, it's 4.25. If they do a 50 basis points, it becomes 4.75. Still short. Another 50, so that's about uh, 5.25. Still short. Uh, because your inflation rate is 5.6%. That's the latest forecast. So it will, it will require two more 50 basis points or three more 50 basis points for probably to make a dent. Okay? But at the same time, uh, that, will help, uh, that will help arrest the capital outflow. I mean, if we don't uh, see it in the broadsheet, we are now seeing uh, a severe uh, capital outflow in the Philippines. Uh, but at the same time, we don't see a corresponding uh, inflow inflow of capital. Okay, so we are getting more. We are we are losing more than we are getting more. Okay, number two. If the, if the BSP starts, uh, or it has started to intervene heavily in the foreign exchange market, this is our uh, takeaway message from our 41 years of service at the BSP. You cannot beat the market. Okay? You cannot beat the market unless uh, you are in a uh, currency board like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is in a currency board, which means fixed exchange rate. What, uh, what Hong Kong did was to intervene in the stock market. Okay? They burned the speculators in the stock market. Okay? And they won. But in our case, it's supposed to be a flexible exchange rate system. Now, um, if you take a look at the foreign currency deposit accounts of private individuals, companies deposited in the commercial banks, okay? and if you take a look at the uh, level of uh, domestic uh, uh, liquidity, meaning M3, uh, the, the component of money that is kept with the banks, either deposit or current account, etc. Now, that is what you are faced against. They can use their domestic uh, currency to speculate against uh, against the US dollar, against the peso, by using the US dollar. Now, the point is this: you can keep it at bay. Maybe for a number of years, a number of days or number of weeks. But over time, if you have economic fundamentals 
explaining the weakness of the peso. No way, no? No way your exchange rate uh, intervention in the FX market will produce a result. It will go back to where it started. So, sayang lang. Sayang. All right. So, uh, we just want to go into the chat box. We have a question from Eddie Yap. So, question for Gov, Gov Diwa, my fellow FEFR. What accounts for a huge 64% plunge in the July FDI? This is from Eddie Yap. Well, investors like credit rating agencies, uh, stock market players, and IFIs or international financial institutions look at key economic indicators, economic and financial indicators like inflation. And inflation is at an all-time high of 6.9 since uh, October of 2018. Uh, number two, uh, if you take a look at uh, the debt, uh, the, the, the overall government debt, that's about 13 trillion already. No? Uh, it's still uh, quite manageable. It's about 60, 61% of GDP. But if it continues to rise, and we expect that to rise, because if it is, uh, if we have a case where uh, growth may not be at its fullest, then government revenues, whether tax or non-tax, will also be uh, will also be weak, and therefore, the government has no option but to continue borrowing from the market. So you will see a, a continuing rise in uh, in external debt. That's one and two. Uh, its impact on debt servicing could be very taxing on government finances. They are looking at that too. Okay? The peso is also uh, depreciating and depreciating fast. So those who are investing, for example, in manufacturing uh, uh, and other types of uh, production activities, and you rely on imports, then uh, your, your inputs would be more expensive uh, in peso terms because uh, of the exchange rate uh, depreciation, okay? So I think most of these uh, economic uh, fundamentals are monitored by uh, prospective uh, investors, okay? So to me, that is one explanation. The other explanation could be uh, there is, you know, internal consolidation of many uh, uh, bankers and uh, industrial uh, owners. And I think they are on a uh, wait and see attitude. Some of them are in wait and see uh, attitude. So altogether, if you put them, if you put them all together, I think that would explain uh, the relative weakness of uh, foreign direct investment in uh, July and in the first, uh, first uh, seven months of the year. I think that went down from four and a half billion to much, much lower uh, level as reported in the broadsheets. Thank you. So uh, PP Jun Jun first and then Tony Lopez asked. Uh, would you advocate some form of currency control you know, as a means of buying time for the economy to be able to you know, improve and become more competitive. Would you advocate for something like that? Well, before we go to that last resort, last policy resort, I think we should try two things. One is uh, macroprudential measures. Macroprudential measures are those measures that literally put sands in the wheels, so to speak. In short, you don't uh, put controls on currency movement but you make it harder. In other words, if you want to invest here in the Philippines, you have to keep your deposit, let's say for the, for the next six months at least. We did that before, okay? And I think that would produce results. Second is to go into swap arrangement with some of the bigger central banks in the region, okay? Uh, for example, uh, we have one with the Bank of Japan. We give them, I think, 500 million uh, in case something uh, in the balance of payments or external payments position uh, uh, breaks down. But in turn, 
uh, they will give us about $12 billion. It's a swap, okay? It's a swap of our domestic currency, but we give them, but we, but we receive from them domestic, uh, foreign exchange, either in dollars or Japanese yen, because Japanese yen is convertible, okay? Uh, so macroprudential measures literally put sands on the wheels. And second is uh, swap arrangement. Swap arrangement, uh, if, you, if you announce that well and make it prominent, then uh, people playing uh, fire in the foreign exchange market will take hit and say, oh, he has additional $12 billion should intervention be necessary. Oh. If nothing comes out of those two, following uh, the prescription of the International Monetary Fund, then we are justified to put in place currency controls. Remember the, remember the experience of Malaysia uh, during the time of Mahathir, okay? They decided to put up uh, currency controls and they were punished for it. They suffered for the next few years after that. To take a look at the foreign, uh, uh, foreign investment, both direct and portfolio, it was almost zero for the next for the few years after they put up those controls. We don't want to uh, we don't want to uh, to uh, put our people in uh, in that in that kind of a situation where because of this uh, inability okay, uh, to control or to manage the currency movement, we put up currency control. I was saying earlier, it is not correct to say completely that the peso is weak because the dollar is strong. I was saying earlier in my presentation, there are economic fundamentals that would explain why the peso is weak. Now, unless you address the weaknesses of the economy from that standpoint, no matter how much you intervene in the foreign exchange market, how much increases, uh, uh, how much policy increases uh, you institute, I don't think uh, they will produce uh, good results. I think what, what we need today is really a strong statement from the leadership. This is what we intend to do, and we will do it. What it takes, we will do it. But explain to the general public, especially to the Chamber of Commerce and Industries no? uh, and, other, and other business organizations, what the government is planning to do. In other words, inspire them and encourage them that something is being done. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, Senior Pastor Gunigundo, that was a very good presentation, very thorough. And we also want to thank you for your service in the PSP because we know in that team, we went through the Asian financial crisis. We went through the... Lehman Brothers, no, and your service was certainly um, very much appreciated. Uh, the topic, I the the question I have, uh, I'm going to dwell on international reserves, which you did not touch very much on during your presentation. Uh, you, you know, as a simple uh, retired, I look I look at the whole scenario of our economy, and before the but before the pandemic or during the pandemic, the country was boasting we had $110 billion. I think only a few days ago, it was announced we're down to $95 billion. Is that something we should be concerned about? Or it's, it's the least of all the factors that have to be looked upon? Thank you. Uh, well, you, you can read my column on Thursday. That's my topic. Okay. From twenty from two thousand, okay, from two thousand to two thousand and six, our gross international reserves were lower than our external debt. Lower. Mas maliit yung ating reserves kesa dun sa ating utang na panlabas. Okay. Because of the global financial crisis, when the U.S. as well as Europe decided to go into unconventional monetary and fiscal policies, meaning keeping their interest rates close to zero, a lot of these investors, foreign portfolio investors, flocked to the emerging markets, including the Philippines. So we had so much foreign exchange at the time, okay? literally flowing out of our ears. And that gave us time for the BSP 
to start accumulating reserves. And in 2007, okay, in 2007, we started uh, accumulating so much reserves, growing by 6 billion every year, 10 billion, 12 billion every year. In the past, in the 1990s and more so in the 1980s, if we grow by $500 million, we were happy. We were ecstatic. But this time around, the growth was about $10 billion, $12 billion per year. Okay? And then um, we started having gross international reserves higher than our external debt up to the end of 2021. Our reserves were higher compared to the level of external debt. Okay? In 2021, our external, our external debt was about 106 billion. And then our gross international reserves was about 107, 108. Okay? Now, but the problem is this. Our external debt continued to grow, especially during the pandemic. Remember, we have uh, very little revenues, government revenues. So we decided to go into borrowing, heavy borrowing at that. So we, we could see that between 2000 and 2021 and 2022, the increase was more than 12 to $13 billion per year. So we ended up our, uh, in June at $107, $106 billion in external debt. In terms of reserves, you were right, from $107.7 billion in December 2021, it went down to $95 billion. So you have $95 billion of your reserves, okay? And that is for reserve purposes, and you have $106, $107 billion in external debt. Now, that's a very cursory way of comparing the so-called solvency Okay, of an individual or a sovereign like the Philippines by comparing its reserves, it's no different from the balance sheet of a household or a, corp or a corporation. You have here your total reserves of, one hand of 95 against your external debt of 107. So you are short. Of course, if the IMF is to have its way, it will revert to what it calls arametric. Assessment of Preserved Adequacy Metrics. Here, they, uh, they, uh, they look at at least four, four, uh, four metrics. Imports, um, broad money, meaning uh, your M3 plus foreign currency deposit. That's, that, that brings to you uh, your broad money or M4. And then imports, broad money, uh, exports, what, how much you earn. And then fourth is external debt. So if you put them together, they arrive at one single measure, arametric. Now, on that basis, um, our, our research should only be around 50 to 60 billion. But we hit a high of 107 in 2021. So based on the IMF, we are at about 2.3 times the adequate reserve metrics. So tama lang, okay lang. Okay, but moving forward, if your reserves continue to decline and your external debt continues to increase, your 2.3 metrics will start going down. So you don't see, you don't say, oh, okay, pa rin yan. Kasi 2.3 pa rin eh. Uh, hindi, hindi man lang one. No. I think you have to be forward looking. If this trend continues, going down, I mean, reserves are going down and your uh, external debt is going up. And I think the likelihood is very high because, uh, because we need money for infrastructure. We need money for budgetary requirements. Okay? We need money for intelligence fund huh? and, and confidential fund. Okay? So we, we may need to borrow. Okay? We may need to borrow. Okay, so uh, the, the trend is almost inevitable okay, that we see less than uh, 2.3 in the near future. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. So uh, next up, uh, PP Bimbo. 
please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Governor, for the lecture. Now, sir, my understanding is our main tool for uh, inflation targeting is interest rates. But key point is it will impact, I think uh, we know that it will impact investments, okay? And investments is what we need to increase production capacity, which is what we really need so that we can increase local production, reduce imports, and hopefully balance in the long run. So yes, it is slower, but it might kill uh, if we just focus on, on uh, interest rate, uh, that interest rate tool, monetary tool, um, what other incentives or initiatives do you suggest uh, to balance that off? Because I think uh, all businesses now are really on wait and see already. And if when the interest rates go another 550 basic points, uh, a lot of even construction will start to slow down uh, substantially because of that. No. So, uh, what are the ah, second question is is it correct that we are happy that we're able to float our bond at 5.5 percent this 500 billion is that a recognition that we're okay in the market uh, for sovereign debt well uh, at the risk of being repetitive no I, I would have wanted to show the so-called flattening of the Phillips curve but I, I will I will try to avoid that no the point is this, there's a policy paradox or a policy dilemma. The BSP is caught between uh, the devil and the blue sea, the deep blue sea. If it increases the policy rate, I think it will bring down inflation rate. If we take a look at the experience of Paul Volcker in the US, he really caused a recession, okay? Jobo Fernandez caused a recession, but he was able to leak inflation. At that time, inflation was hitting uh, 47 to 50% in 1984. So what Jobo did was to come up with the so-called Jobo bills or Central Bank Certificate of Indebtedness. But he was able to bring down inflation. And I think it is at this point that the BSP finds itself. Okay? If it doesn't do it fast and aggressive, it will be almost difficult and not impossible to bring down inflation altogether. On the other hand, okay, it will also cause recession. Slow down, if you will. So the, BSP, man, the BSP's mandate is this, price stability. Okay? It is the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture, DTI, Department of Finance, NEDA, to encourage economic growth. The BSP's job is to keep prices stable. Because if you, see, if, you, if you take a look at it, inflation is the great disequalizer. Everybody is affected by inflation, especially the fixed income earners like many of us especially the poor, okay? especially the poor. In terms of economic growth, hopefully, if, if, if quality uh, jobs are available, then people will have access to the fruits of development. But that's the job of the BSP. So for me, yes, it is necessary for the BSP to continue jacking up interest rate in a very decisive way and to act fast. It should now be the job of uh, the fiscal authorities, DTI, Department of Agriculture, NEDA, uh, DOTC, the ICT, and even the Department of Labor to produce more output, more supply, so that inflation will start coming down. And even then, it, uh, the peso will also start to, uh, to moderate in time. Okay? Because once you allow um, inflation to be out of control, it will almost be difficult, if not impossible, to bring it down. Now, what are the um, countervailing forces or uh, measures that could soften the blow or to at least um, 
moderate what you need to do in terms of uh, interest rate adjustment. I was saying earlier, foreign exchange intervention. But our friend was right in saying that uh, baka maubos lang yung FX. At times, you have to make yourself felt in the market that the BSP's hand is there. And it is not releasing the nominal anchor in the foreign exchange market. If the BSP completely takes off its hand from the foreign exchange market, tuwan-tuwa ngayon ang mga speculators. The BSP is not there. So sometimes the BSP has to do it. What Gandhi is saying, it may look unimportant, it may look uh, insignificant, but you have to do it. You have to let your hand be felt by the market lest they misbehave. Thank you, Governor Diwa. So just going back to the chat box here, we have a question submitted by George Barcelon. So prior to the logistics congestion, Suez Canal blockage, COVID-19, and now the Europe geopolitical war, before all this happened, the Philippines was doing pretty well. Now the question is, are our macroeconomic fundamentals still intact for growth? And is our currency stability prior to the above external factors still intact? What gives? And will something have to break? Thank you. It's a very ticklish question because uh, in the last two years of the pandemic, there was no demand. Okay? People uh, were out of jobs. Unemployment was double digit. Okay? And uh, even medical workers, frontline medical workers, could not report for work in the hospitals. Okay? So there was literally a, a standstill. Okay? So without demand, even if your supply is okay, okay, or even short, Inflation was not a problem. Uh, I think in 2018, 2019, 2017 was about 5 point, 2018 was about 5.2 uh, inflation. And then 2.5, 2.5, 3.9 in 2 point, uh, 2021. Okay? So walang problema. But when we started uh, removing all of those lockdowns and uh, mobility restrictions and the firms started to produce again and people started to work again, then you have those repressed demand. Some people would call it revenge spending. Okay? Then prices started going up. Some people started going on tourism. So again, uh, the economy started uh, becoming alive again. But then what gives? Well, we have inflation. Okay. Uh, we have inflation, and uh, because the uh, balance of payments is bad, it is now showing uh, uh, a large shortfall or a large deficit. Okay, the peso is uh, is depreciating. On top of that, because the dollar is strong, it contributes to the weakening of the U of the of the Philippine peso. Okay. But to me, the potential for growth is still there. Although the, uh, the so-called ICOR, incremental capital output ratio, must have come down. The total labor productivity must have also come down because of what we call economic scarring. No? We have two years of graduates from the universities who don't receive the right education. Even our high school and elementary uh, school children receive subpar kind of education. I mean, what do you, what do you get from uh, doing it by a Zoom? In the provinces, they would have to go to the roof or on top of the tree to get the signals. Okay? And sometimes they rely on, 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 on their smartphones, not even, a, not even a laptop or an iPad. Okay? So what kind of education did we give to our children in the last two years. Now, several years from now, there is economic scarring because we need to return the governor, uh, Diwa, and George Barcelona here. Of our labor sector because of, of our labor. I don't know whether uh, you can hear laborers. me. 
or members of the labor force. If we don't do that, okay, if we don't do that, our labor productivity is going to come down even farther. Remember, based on PISA, okay, this is the assessment of what kind of education we're giving to our children. We are down there in the cellar. We are the cellar dweller. Mas mataas pa sa atin ang Vietnam, mas mataas pa sa atin ang, ang Cambodia and Laos in reading, in math, in science. Okay? So, um, but thanks to more than 25 years of policy and structural reforms, which we have put in place since the time of President uh, Ramos, okay? We began to deregulate the industries. We began to liberalize uh, economic activities. And in the new Public Service Act, we uh, allowed the Congress to redefine uh, what public utilities are so that more foreign investments can come in, participate, and compete. Now, in a situation where you have competition, prices start coming down. The cost starts uh, coming down. So we have a better uh, an improved uh, economic uh, condition in the Philippines precisely because of those 25 years of policy and, uh, and structural reform. So in, um, in, in response to our friend uh, George, I think we can still grow by between six to six and a half for 2022, okay, 2022. But moving forward, if you take a look at the forecast of the international financial institutions, they are downgrading that six to six and a half percent forecast for 2022 to around five. For some IFIs and credit rating agencies, it is, it's, it's as slow as 5% or, or even below 5%, precisely because of this uh, economic scarring effects of the two years of the, of the pandemic. Without those policy and structural reforms, it would have been more difficult for us. Thank you for that. So we have may time I, for one uh, last I, question. May I interject? Uh, may I interject uh, the statement of hello? I don't think they can hear us, George. Yeah, I don't think they can. Yeah, I yeah. don't think. They well, can. this is a, I would say, a, a populist question. Uh, we have had sufficient amount of technical data, uh, econometric data. That's fantastic, uh, Governor. But my question is, uh, I'm just baffled because just yesterday or the other day in the front page of bulletin, our technocrat governor came up with a statement that said that we're now, our economy is now in a much better shape. It is definitely so intriguing amidst all of these negative economic, <laughs> economic indicators that we have, inflation, depreciation, uh, food scarcity, etc. I can go on and on. But perhaps he may know something, or you people from DSP in the past would know something that we don't because our technocrat governor gave that empathic uh, description of our economy. It will depend on <laughs> what period he is comparing. Okay? If he is comparing 2020 and 2021 against 2022, yes, our 2022 prospects are brighter because during 2020, we suffered a recession. In 2022, in 2021, we barely grew. Now, in 2022, middle of the year, we started uh, saying that uh, it's, it, it, it looks like the pandemic may be considered to be behind us. Therefore, uh, face masks are now optional. Social distancing is now optional. Um, people can go out. Uh, conferences can be held, etc., etc. So with more uh, personal mobility, the economy was removed from a lockdown. So you have revenge spending, you have repressed demand being uh, put out there in the, in the public domain, et cetera, et cetera. 
So against 2020 recession and against 2021, still suffering from the pandemic, 2022 is definitely in a better shape. Okay, in a better shape. But look, the, I mean, economic development is a very dynamic process. 2022 may be just the beginning of, uh, of the chapter. We were saying earlier, uh, you have a 5.6% inflation for the entire year of, two point, of uh, 2022. Now, when inflation is very high, that can compromise consumption expenditure. Kung mataas ang presyo ng bilihin, mas kukunti ang mabibili mo. Mas kukunti ang gagastusin mo. Kasi mahal eh. Okay? Now, how much is consumption expenditure, private consumption expenditure in the overall things in terms of gross domestic product is 72%. So if 72% starts to weaken because of inflation, you will have problems with growth. You will have problems with growth. And if the, if inflation, if, if, uh, if the exchange rate continues to depreciate because the dollar is strong, the dollar is strong because the U.S. Fed will continue to jack up interest rate, okay? then the peso will start moving down. Now it's 58, tomorrow it's 59. And I don't know if, if Joey Salceda's uh, pre prognosis is accurate, it could go down to as, to as low as 68 to a dollar. And if that happens, I don't know what happens to our domestic inflation. If domestic inflation further goes up, you can say goodbye to 72% of consumption expenditure as part of your gross domestic product. So when you hear Philip say it again, I think we have to ask him, Philip, what are you describing? 2022 against 2021 and 2020. Okay? Because if you take a look at the next year, 2023, I was early saying earlier, your forecast for 2023 is lower than 2022, which means that the things that are brewing in 2022 could have a spillover effects in 2023. And that's bad. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, what a rich discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor Diwa. We really appreciate your time and all of the, uh, the information that you've shared with us. Um, at this point in time, uh, I'd like to offer a, a token of our appreciation to our governor. Uh, we'd like to give you some of the token gifts from the Rotary Club. We'd like to thank you for all the time you've spent and all the knowledge that you've shared with us. So, Governor, this is a uh, this is a plaque. Okay, uh, what we do is one of our projects is we actually resuscitate reefs, uh, damaged coral reefs around the country. You know, and we're working on a project now to resuscitate coral reefs in Quezon. And so we we plant what we call reef buds, which allow coral reefs to re, to spawn in the area. And in each reef bud, we have a plaque, and one plaque is going to be named after you. Okay, so you will have your own personal reef in Quezon, Governor. Okay, with your name on it. This is a replica of the plaque that will be in your reef bud. We'll try and take a picture of it so you can actually see the actual reef bud. Yes, thank you. And then we have uh, we have our Rotary uh, anniversary book, 55 years of the Rotary Club of Makati. And then uh, we have a nice bottle of wine to go with uh, it in case you would like to... Uh, to read the book with uh, some wine. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you. For me. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to call them our meeting uh, to adjourn our meeting. Thank you very much, everybody.